I want to do this in front of this moment. The Lord gave us the Lord's Supper really to, to push attention away from us, away from leaders, away from preachers and, and towards himself. And I want to keep this really before us as we talk about what it is to be the body of Christ. Jesus told us that with this bread, this symbolizes the body of Christ. And as we take it, what I want to do is really infuse meaning into this moment. So it's not just routine. We're actually going to partake of Christ and recognize our place in his body as we take of this, this bread. I've asked for the guys deliberately to keep it whole so that we can take symbolically whole one Christ, many members, and we're each going to take a part of Christ and recognize that we each have a part. Amen. Last Sunday was super special, right? We had Fussy here um, and the place was packed and we were recognizing new elders and new deacons and it was a very special Sunday for us. But it was much more than just a high Sunday and talking with people and even sensing in my heart, it, it does feel like God's taking us into a new season. And you hear that like bubbling faith from various parts of the church. And it feels like God's moving us into a new season. And I was reminded last week when Steve Oliver was with us a year ago, he prophesied, prayed for us that we would become um, not like a well. And he described a well like you have to dig a well. I've never dug a well, but theoretically, apparently you have to dig a well. It is hard work. And then even to get water out of the well, you have to put buckets down, you have to draw it up. And he says there is a difference between being a well and having a spring the where spring it just bubbles up from underneath and the role of someone with a spring is to simply take the water and steward it and over the last few weeks i think it's begun to feel more and more like a spring and less like a well that it's not a few leaders trying to do something good for jesus and do something good for the church but actually there's life bubbling up all across the church and really the leader's role in these moments is just to steward the river of life. Jesus said, didn't he, if you believe in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from you. And it feels like God's taking us into a new moment where actually there is this river of life that's beginning to flow and bubble up across the church. And this, the secret for this to happen is that it doesn't become a couple of people who do the stuff but actually, there is a community where across the church, there is a bubbling up of the Holy Spirit. If we're going to see this bubbling up, the fullness of the Spirit overflow in the church, it's going to mean not just a few people living with excitement and energy and passion and gifting, but a whole community engaged in serving the body. The very beginning of this letter in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul talks about this and it's interesting because this is a church I mean if you were to do an audit of this church on a normal Sunday morning in Corinth you would probably go and say this church is crazy like there is no order everyone's speaking over one another there is way too much excitement you'd be like calm down guys you've got to sit and be a bit more regimented but Paul, he starts by thanking the church. And this is what he says. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched, you were filled in him in all speech and all knowledge, hinting at some of the gifts that they were being given, even as a testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. And he says, so that you, plural church, you church are not lacking in any gift. This is what he gave thanks for. Church, I look at you and I thank God that you don't lack any gifts. You are full of spiritual gifts. He sees what's happening and he is glad. That is the, his first emotion. And I think what he does when he comes to this passage in chapter 12 is he picks up this theme of this fullness of spiritual gifts and he starts to really practically apply and try to unlock some of the gifts that are still there and some of the ways that this well-like experience, sorry, spring-like experience can be blocked up. And so what I want to do is just three things. I want to, I'm going to get a little bit practical because Paul seems to get a little bit practical with us and talk about some of the ways, two attitudes that can keep us as a church from experience some of the fullness, some of the gifts being released and used and blessing one another. 
and then I want to talk about our identity briefly and then I want to talk about some of the ways in which we can serve one another as a church and then we're going to break bread amen so the fullness of the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts there seems to be this attitude that Paul has or, or not that Paul has sorry they, the, these two attitudes that are prevalent in the church and are a danger in all of us and if we were to have these attitudes it would keep us from really experiencing the fullness that God has for us and the first one is this it's this attitude that that says to one another I'm not needed around here it's this feeling of like looking at the church and saying I don't I don't think I'm actually required around here this is what he seems to say look in verse 14 of this passage he says for the body does not consist of one member but of many and if the foot should say because I'm not a hand I don't belong to the body I'm not like you guys I'm not like I haven't got that kind of glamorous hand like gift that you have I'm just a foot that would not make it any less a part of the body and if the ear should say because I'm not an eye you know I can't see like you guys I'm not like I'm just there on the side I'm an ugly thing to look at if you really stare at me long enough I don't belong to the body that would not make it any less a part of the body if the whole body were an eye where would the sense of hearing be if the whole body were an ear where would be the sense of smell it's this attitude that withdraws itself and says I don't really have anything to offer why might you feel like this let me share some reasons very practically and very today I'm not saying this is you I'm saying this may be why some of us feel like we have nothing to offer in church the first is this you look around and you think my gifts are not like those gifts that I see this is the, the prevalent illustration that he gives so many of us are really a bit uncertain about what spiritual gifts we have but what we actually do is we look at some of the gifts from up front at church worship leading prophetic gifts preaching gifts and we often say well I don't have those gifts and then we assume I'm not sure therefore I've got any gifts and we discount ourselves and we feel like I'm not like that person up there who happens to have the microphone and we think well, I'm not like them so I've got nothing to offer you may not feel like you've got anything to offer if you're a little bit older I'm not looking at anyone I mean I'm, I'm in that weird twilight zone of 41 now so I'm like I don't know whether I'm young or old I'm just like midlife crisis zone apparently it's 42 and a half I read a few weeks ago which is like a bit ominous anyway what if you're a bit old because this is my experience just as I looked at my life when I was like in my teens and then went off to university I was like focused on what I was doing right I was like head forward going this I got plans dreams excitement I'm like I'm leaving home I'm going to university the world's ahead of me and I didn't really think about my sisters at home or my parents at home and it's only like 20 years later I'm kind of thinking oh yeah my family you know I've got a family back there but, but what happened as a young person I think very often you just go head on and it can leave the mums and dads, the elders in the, fa in the family or in the church of God thinking, I don't really want my help. They don't ask for help. No, but they never ask for help. And it can feel like, because we're quite a young church, if you're slightly older, you think, maybe this isn't the church for me because actually we're desperately in need of elders, mums and dads in the church. The youngers don't tend to ask for help, but they do need help. They need an older, a mum or a dad to actually go after them and ask questions and be interested and can I pray for you, what's going on with your course or your... But you might feel like that. You might feel like you've not got a part to play if English isn't your first language. Because you feel like, you know, just talking to someone who English isn't your first language, like sometimes there is a confidence issue, isn't there? Like that's what I hear from me, like, I don't want to talk, I don't want to speak, I don't want to read the Bible passage because of my, my English. But actually you don't know the kind of blessing it is to have you participate and share and we want all sorts of ethnicities and cultures gathering together as one amen but you might feel like oh i don't know my english isn't don't worry your english is far better probably than you imagine if we can't understand you we'll tell you it's like no, we didn't understand any of that but we understand you you may not feel like you've got a part to play if 
you have been rejected in the past. If you've had some kind of trauma in your past or someone important in your life has rejected you, what can very often happen, isn't it, that you kind of reject yourself before anyone else can get there first, right? You think, why would I put myself out there and offer myself? Because what if they don't actually want my help or I don't do it very well, or it's just kind of like a bit, mm, thanks and people, that would be far worse than just rejecting myself and holding myself safe, amen? Sometimes people do that. So they never contribute the gift that they have, who they are. Sometimes if you're an introvert, you might naturally think, oh, I'm not sure. It's, one of, it's not a big concern. It's not like an existential crisis concern, but I do sometimes wonder because we're quite a loud church generally. We have Marcia in our church. So we've got, you know, <laughs> we have Brazilians in our church. We have quite a lot of like loud, leadery, bantery types. And I sometimes wonder, like, I, I don't want us just to become a loud extrovert church, you know? I want us to be a place where if you're an introvert, you've got a, you've got a place here. Yeah, you've got gifts to contribute. There is something, and often the most powerful moments, the most powerful contributions come from those who have actually thought about something and said something sensible rather than all the loudmouths who just yibby rabbering all day long, amen? This is a place for introverts, but you might not feel like you've got something. Sometimes anxiety and depression has this way of kind of just closing our lives in and making our lives small. Sometimes the enemy can jump on the back of that think ah just it's just me I, i'm got i just want to get through my we each have a part to play paul gives us two antidotes here he says in verse 18 as it is god has arranged the members in the body each one of them as he chose so if you're tempted to think i don't have any role to play here i don't have anything to contribute Probably you are comparing yourself to others in the church. You are looking at others and then thinking, mm, I discount myself. I, I can't contribute. But one of the key antidotes is to not look at the church, but to look at God and find peace in the knowledge that God has made you exactly as he desires. Why do you shape to your background or everything growing up is part of how God wants to use you in the very moment right now. You think, well, I didn't have all the privileges and other things got up. No, it doesn't matter. God is going to use that and redeem that to bless the church now. That God has chosen this moment for you to be in this church. And so who you are and what you have and what you can do is vitally important so we don't compare we look to god and say god what have you done in my life i'm gonna give and bless the church and then he says this that i actually we need to be different verse 19 if we were a single member just imagine a body that would just like pick out one one limb you know any kind of i think any bit of your body if you stare at it long enough i've discovered becomes intensely strange and weird just any body you know any part of your body like you might think oh i've got a great this or whatever stare at it long enough it'll become very strange i promise you but imagine if we were just like one nose you know just a nose hopping to church bouncing down the streets coming to you know what good is that we need the whole body everything working together if we're going to be strong where where would the body be if we're just a single member actually difference it's not a reason to disqualify you. I don't, I don't look like people. I, don't, I haven't got the same background. That's not a reason to say I haven't got anything to give for it. It's actually a reason to say I've got something to contribute. Difference is our strength as a church. Amen. So that's the first attitude. And the second attitude is this. I don't need you. The first is you don't need me. The first is I don't need you. This is what he says in verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Imagine the head saying, look, like I'm, I'm the on display gift. I'm the head. Feet, look at you. You're always hidden. No one wants to see you. Your ugly toes and what all that, like go away. I'm here. And what, the feet could just say, oh, fine, I'm staying at home then. The head would be like, oh, no, I need to go to work. No, stuff it. I'm staying at home if you don't need me. We all need one another. Why might you feel like you don't need the church? 
Let me just throw out some examples. You might be naturally confident. I've got gifts, I can do life, I know how things work. I'm very competent, I can do things with my mind, with my hands, I've got money. And so you're naturally confident. You think, I don't, I don't really need other people. And so you just carry on with your own life, forging your own path. You might feel settled in London. Let me explain this. I think there's a natural story that often happens in London. People arrive in London and maybe single with a partner, with a spouse, and they're vulnerable and they need friends. They don't really know anybody. So they've got, they need, oh my gosh, I need. And there is a church that provides friendship and support and community and say, I need you. I, I want help. And it provides relational help and financial help and spiritual help. And you find a way of connecting in London. And then what happens over time is you get promotions, you get a bit of money, you buy a car, you maybe, pigs may fly, buy a house. And then you feel like, oh, okay, we're settling. And then you have a kid and then your kids. And then when you're at the school gate, then you're in that routine. You feel like, okay, now we're settled because we're in the... And what was once we're vulnerable in this city and we need community becomes, actually, we're quite settled and we're doing all right, actually. And so you stop feeling like you need the church because you can just do life. Am I making sense? You can see how that story can play itself out. And if you've been growing up in London, you think, well, I don't really need a church because I'm fine. I've got my family, I've got my job, I, I know how things work. And so I, I don't need the church. What if you're overly career focused? I say overly career focused because to be career focused, I don't think is an ungodly thing. It's why we have work matters but to be overly career focused so that everything becomes around job, career, finance, you know, promotions, the next thing. So that when you come to church, you know, it's high impact at work, it's decisions, it's crunchy, it feels exciting. You're making decisions, things are happening. It's flashy, the office is nice. And then you come to church and it's a bit slow and it's kind of worship and you can't really work out the utilitarian value of like what's happening where's the practical help how is this going to help me with my career and you think i don't really need church because actually i'm really about work and before you know it, you say i don't need you what about if you're a weird person anyone a weird person all right okay andrew says stephen is a weird person all right okay and by weird I, I, I mean, I'm not coining this myself, um, by Joe, Joe Henrik wrote a book called Weird People. Some of you might have read this. And by weird people, he meant Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Basically describing our church, apart from the Western bit, but educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. And he described us, I think, mainly. And he said this, weird people are highly individualistic, self-obsessed, not me, of course not, <laughs> control-oriented, non-conformist, and analytical. We focus on ourselves, our attributes, our accomplishments, and our aspirations over our relationships and social roles. <laughs> I thought, old oh, crumbs. That's us, right? That's London. It's us, our careers, our aspirations over the social roles, which is why many people in London carry on through years and years and actually find themselves lonely because they were so career focused, they never invested in friendships or family and they find themselves in their later life lost. So you think, well, I don't need the church. This is Paul's admonition his antidote on the contrary the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable we bestow the greater honor and our unrepresentable parts are treated with greater modesty which our more presentable parts do not require but god has so composed the body giving greater honor to the part that lacked it that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another that those who seem to have greater honour in a body are to give actual honour to those who seem to have less recognition. So you might say, well, the face is super important, right? The hands are really important. But actually, you will know people who have no legs and no hands or no arms 
and actually live a very full life. Why? Because the more important gifts to a body are things like the heart, the liver, the kidneys, the things that we don't see. Which is why people like Joel and Aaron and <laughs> Joel was like, what? You just name checked me? <laughs> On a hilly. People who are here at 8.30 in the morning getting cables connected and chairs out and getting the place open and for us deserve great honour amongst us because without these who don't stand up at the front there's, there's no church it's not going to happen and so we recognise all the gifts so much so that we move as one so Paul says in verse 26 if one member suffers all suffer together if one member is honoured we all rejoice together so if one person is sick we rush to them and pray with them if another another member gets a promotion we rush and we applaud them and celebrate them we don't think well what about where's my promotion or where's my home or where's my spouse where's my child no we celebrate where there is honor and we suffer with those who are suffering because we come together as one body amen and the key to all of this is our identity. This is what he says in verse 27. Now you, Trinity Church London, are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You are the body of Christ. Which means that I have a place in an honoured community where Christ is the head. One who was crucified for me so that I could play a part I have an honourable role and I have a status because I'm in the body of Christ. So I don't take my status primarily from my gifts, but from my relationship with Christ. And he has welcomed me in. And secondly, I am a member, individual member of that body, which means I am just a part. So I have status and I'm just a part. I have privileges and I have responsibilities. I'm not the main thing. Jesus is the main thing. I just have a part. Which if we can all understand, I just have a part. Oh my goodness, how releasing is that? I just have a part to play. I don't have to make everything happen. I don't have to see the kingdom come by myself. It is us as a church. And as I play my part with the privileges of Christ, we can then see gifts unlocked. So in just a moment, we're going to gather around this bread and we're going to take of Christ. And when we take this bread, I'm going to ask us to do something. I'm going to ask us to come down the front and we're each going to take a part of Christ. And as we do that, we are recognising that I have a part and that piece of Christ that you take is something symbolizing your part and then we're going to go back to our chairs and then I'm going to invite you to break bread with someone next to you and tell them look look them in the eye get through the awkwardness say you have a part to play in the body of Christ and break bread for that and then pray for each other amen you have a part to play in the body of Christ let me just share some of the ways in which we can contribute to the body of Christ. Firstly, just coming to church. <laughs> just being here is contributing to the body of Christ. This is what Paul says in Romans 1 when he longed to go to the church in Rome. He said, I long to see you that I might impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. You think, what's that spiritual gift, Paul? You know, what's it going to be? It's a word of knowledge. It's some writing on the wall. It's something he's going to see. It's going to see into someone's soul. It's going to see their sin. It's going to confess their sin. What is it that Paul's got, this spiritual gift? He says, that is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So what's the spiritual gift? I think Paul sees his spiritual gift as simply being amongst the church, living amongst them, speaking truth, and him hearing of their faith. How do we get encouraged by one another's faith? When I hear 
your worship to Jesus, I am strengthened. That is a spiritual gift to someone next to you. If you hear someone praying with faith for the promises of God, I don't know about you, but for me, that is a spiritual gift. Hearing people pray in the morning, 10, 15, hearing their faith for what God will do amongst us as a church is a gift to me that strengthens me and helps reorient my perspective on life and the kingdom and what's happening here in London. That our very presence together is itself a gift to each other. So you might think, well, I was not on a rota today. Uh, I didn't pray for anyone today. You have a spiritual gift to contribute and it is yourself. No one enters here and disappears from here anonymous without an impact on the body. Amen. You have a role, the people to the left and to the right, you are an encouragement. Even when I see someone just lifting their hands in worship, it stirs my heart. I think, he's alive. I, can, I, I see the faith in Pete and Liz and I, he's alive. I want to worship Jesus. You have a spiritual gift and it's yourself. Amen. Let me give you another gift. Arriving at church on time. <laughs> oh my goodness. I didn't tell you it would be profound today. I'm just speaking the truth. I, I, uh, I a lot of my Nigerian brothers and sisters, you know, tell me to be a bit more like their pastor at home, you know, like just tell the church what they need to know. So here I am, repenting of Englishness and being more Nigerian. We need you here, I would say at 10.15 if you can make it, but at 11 o'clock, 5 to 11. The band start worshipping now at 5 to 11 because we're a church of many cultures, right? And so the English people get uptight about time. The Nigerian people are like, no, it's fine. We'll be there and we'll, you know, whatever. We'll stay till as long as it takes to see the kingdom come. We'll pray and we'll outpray you guys. And like, fair enough. But if we don't come here on time, we rob ourselves and each other of the spiritual gift of our presence, of our worship, of our welcome. We're told in Romans 15 that we are to welcome one another as Christ welcomes us. What kind of welcome? That's a lavish welcome. That's an arms wide open kind of welcome. And how do we welcome one another if we're still on the train or just getting on our shoes trying to leave the house at 11 o'clock because we're not at church yet? We can't. And so we rob each other of a spiritual gift if we are not here well on time to have the coffee, to have the biscuits and to give the greeting to someone who might be new to church. We make it early or on time to work. Claire's giving me an amen. amen. <laughs> Let me ask you to make it early to church. I would suggest it is more valuable so that when we get together, <laughs> so that when we get together, we, we don't have very long, do we, church? Like you think about it, the kind of, the way the world is discipling us all week, all the social media, all the phone, all the work, all the culture that we're immersed in, we don't have very long together to breathe in the clean air of the kingdom of God and be discipled by Jesus and to help sharpen one another. And so to rob another half an hour of that, just shrink. And then we expect to grow in the kingdom of God because we've just shortchanged ourselves again. We wonder five years, why did I never change? We never allowed ourselves the space before the service and after the service to do the moments of ministry, to do the moments of the one anothering, to confess into one another, to pray for one another, to welcome one another, to admonish one another, to speak into each other life to hear long enough what's going on in the other person's life so we can actually help and pray and think how can we help you practically we never were able to do it because we came late and we left bang on time at the very end and we wonder why we feel disconnected and we're not growing so here's a good moment next week we have a baptismal service and baptismal services are moments where people often turn up early and who are the people who turn up early to church it's always the people who aren't even Christians. <laughs> they come early. The guests, they arrive early and they sit here wondering like, I thought I was invited to a church. It looks like I'm in some kind of SAS interrogation zone. It's like just me and the leader of the service. You know, it's like super intense. 
and then half an hour around they turn around there oh gosh how can we welcome people to church we, we just come here early so you figure it out i know there's life and things happen but come early amen, amen. all right that went better than i hoped okay <laughs> okay all right seeing as i'm on a roll let me talk about one other thing no maybe two other things but one other thing you won't like and then maybe another thing you will like tithing as a church we have struggled to break even and only two people in this church know who gives what and that's chris and pat anderson because they need to know for the auditing and the accounts and things like that so we don't know but we think at this point in our life as a church we should be breaking even that we should be in a place actually of going from a well to a spring and so if you call yourself a member of this church you you figure that out in your own heart and your own if you're like no i'm not sure yet that's fine i'm not speaking to you if you're not a christian i'm not speaking to you i'm speaking to you if this is part of your church let me lay out the expectations that the bible gives us that we are to tithe our income to the local church that we belong to the place the temple where we get the ministry from god and 10 percent is gross from what we get given i'm being really clear i'm spelling it out as the government gets there first right but spiritually speaking that first 10 percent belongs to god okay so just because the government got there first doesn't mean anything what well, less now what's it going to be the first fruits the first 10 percent goes to god and that's our offering as a baseline giving because of the generosity of god i'm going to serve god and serve his church with this amount of money and then everything else is a special offering it's a thanksgiving offering for the work in regions beyond in the nations to our friends to our colleagues to that charity that's the above and beyond but the baseline way in which we serve the church is through our finance and you know where your heart is really because you know where your finance is so just follow the trail one where, where is my heart just follow the, you can do the maths on it like literally do the maths on the right okay what, what okay oh gosh the scriptures talk about 10 percent. that's a tithe tenth thing and my tenth thing and in this way we serve the body in the west we separate the spiritual from the the physical in a very unhelpful way but ministry depends on finance to happen and so together if you're part of this church you say how, how can i serve in this church if this is your home 10th and we do this together and we're going to go into so much strength one of the things that's amazing i think at the moment is just things that we've been praying for for years like we're actually it feels like we're beginning to touch them like we've been praying for people to be sharing christ and with others and it just feels like there's more and more stories of people having encounters and moments of talking about jesus with other people and we're now beginning to organically connect with all different parts of the nations in all sorts of different ways and people are going and coming and being encouraged and encouraging other parts of the world and we're seeing many more stories and all these things if we're going to see this fanned into flame and this spring just grow and bubble up further we're going to need to resource it with with finance so tithing let me go to one more practical one and then we're going to break bread together because it's funny in here i was just reading this list in verse 28 god has appointed in the church first apostles sounds very exciting prophets everyone wants to be prophesied over like let, let me tell me god what's going on in my life teachers <laughs> miracles that sounds exciting gifts of healing helping <laughs> i was like you know there's like all these really exciting gifts and in the middle of it it's like helping like i don't think i've ever been in a prayer meeting like lord give me the gift of helping other people like but that's a spiritual gift someone to say what needs to happen around here i'll make it happen what kind of life and ministry can happen if people say that how can you help in this church just saying I, I could just do whatever's needed move chairs be there do this whatever it might be i can help now i've got capacity to do this but just tell me something and i'll get it done practical things what a way just to be like a lot of people can do that gift amen sometimes we try and over spiritualize all of this helping is a spiritual gift